Westinghouse. Westinghouse Studio One. Out of 70 years of leadership in research, out of the vision of America's most advanced engineers, out of the widest kind of experience in electrical manufacturing come products for home, farm, and industry that bear this respected mark, this mark of quality, the mark of Westinghouse. You can be sure if it's Westinghouse. Warning. Poisonous black smoke pouring in from Jersey marshes. Reaches South Street. Gas masks useless. Urge population to move into open spaces. Automobiles use Route 7, 23, 24. Avoid congested areas. Smoke now spreading over Raymond Boulevard. result of panic, the blind, unreasoning terror of men who run and do not truly know what they are fleeing. And this is the factual story of such a panic. I'm Ed Murrow, and this is the story of the night America trembled. It was October 30th, 1938, a night rather like other October nights in other years, except for perhaps two factors. First, it was a year in which the nations of the world, at peace for almost 20 years, had recently seen shattered their comfortable illusion of security. 2,000 miles away, across an ocean now realized to be no longer a safeguard against invasion, the arrogant demands of a power-hungry dictator had short weeks before forced haughty Britain and proud France to agree to the humiliating peace of Munich. Thus, point one, that world events had left men shaken and unsure, hence open to emotional attack against their reason, against their intelligence and their logic. Point two is somewhat harder to accept, but it's equally valid. It can be traced back countless centuries beyond civilized mankind's reasoned fear of war to primitive man's instinctive terror of the great unknown. For October 30th was that mysterious night when dark tradition tells us fiends and demons walk the winds of the world. The one night of the year when even sensible men believe that almost anything can happen. The eve of Halloween, 1938 and in a radio studio of the Columbia Broadcasting System in New York City. The actors and staff of the Mercury Theater on the air were putting the final touches to what was frankly a terror tale, which was to go on the air within a few short minutes. We see them now in the final moments of rehearsal with their director. that hissing, humming sound. I'd like you to mix in the hum a little bit faster and build it more than you did the dress. Can you do it? Okay, I'll do it. Okay, let's try it. Phillips? 19? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I've got it. About here. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, the captain and two policemen advanced with something in their hands. As I can see it now, it's a white handkerchief tied to a pole, a flag of truce. If those creatures know what that means, what anything means... No. Wait! Wait! Something's happening! A humped shape is rising out of the pit. 
I can make out a small beam of light against the mirror. What's that? There's a jet of flame springing from that mirror, and it leaps right at the advancing men. It strikes them head on. Good Lord, they're turning to flame. Well, that ought to scare the daylight out of them. It does mean I've been rehearsing it for hours. You never can tell. Radio listeners are pretty blasé now. Bill? Yes, sir. The sequence where you're calling old stations, the CQ call. Page 28? Yeah. Now, Bill, that a shade more. You think you're the last man alive on Earth, so let's have a little more desperation, huh? I don't want to ham it up. Well, this is pure fantasy. Play with all the stops out, okay? Okay. Okay. Fifteen minutes. Fifteen minutes. Right. Okay. All right, everybody, take ten. Positions at 7.55. <coughs> In October of 1938, the Columbia Broadcasting System radio network consisted of 110 affiliated stations in 44 states. There was practically no sizable community in America which could not be reached by CBS broadcast. Thus, from Maine to California and from Canada to the Gulf, listeners were tuned to the Mercury Theater on that fateful night. In the eastern United States, the area closest to the scene of fictitious peril, reaction was most vivid and violent. However, it should be remembered that in their behavior, these Easterners were not unique. Everywhere, emotions and reactions were the same. Panic struck universally out of the dark but peaceful sky on a night that began quietly enough. Hello, Bob. Good evening, Miss Morgan. Come on in. Mary will be down in a minute. Thank you. Hello, Mr. Morgan. Hello, Bob. Nice out? Yes, sir. It's swell. Getting chilly? No, it's just right. Perfect football weather. You see the game yesterday? You bet I did. 14 to nothing. <laughs> Pretty good team this year, huh? Seventh in the national rating. We ought to be first, too. We haven't even been scored on yet. Those seven iron dukes. Think they'll make the Rose Bowl? Well, I'll tell you, I think if we can get by Syracuse and Pitt, we got a good chance. Hi, but Bob. We... Hi, Dan. <laughs> Sorry to keep you waiting. That's okay. we got plenty of time. Second show doesn't start for an hour. Oh, where are we going? I thought maybe the re, uh, Alto. Oh, what's playing there? Ginger Rogers and Fred Astaire and Carefree. <laughs> you seen it? No, but I'd love to. Good night, Dad. Bob, don't keep her out too late. No, sir. <laughs> good night, Mom. Good night, dear. Night, Bob. Good night, Miss Morgan. What's on tonight, Dad? Uh, what time is it? Oh, getting on to eight. Uh, CBS, the Mercury Theater, NBC, Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy. Charlie McCarthy. Yeah. I like him. Let's listen to that. You know, you take now a punk like this Hitler, all spit and polish, the mob yell and hail every time he wipes his nose. A guy like him don't raise an army just for the fun. Mark my words, there's going to be trouble. Maybe even sooner than you think. Uh, Hitler's just a big bag of wind. Oh, I don't know about that now. Yeah, Phyllis. He already grabbed Austria and Czechoslovakia, ain't he? Now he's got his eye on Poland. A big bag of wind. Everybody made the mistake was they never should have buckled under him from the beginning. If they just told him to go jump in the lake, well, what could he do? Huh? Huh? France on the west, Russia on the east, Mussolini in the south. <laughs> he can't move a muscle in any direction. Yeah, he could go up. Up? Yeah. Hit all of a sudden from the air anywhere he likes. America. America? Sure, why not? Oh, I'd like to see him try to bomb this country. Yeah, you maybe, but not me. Because he just might get away with it. I don't want to be nowhere around when the bomb starts falling. You know, you sound like them Europeans. They're all too yellow to call us bluff. Yellow? What do you mean yellow, huh? Well, I just said... Yeah, I heard what you said. You think I'm yellow, is that oh, it? Now, wait a minute. Come on. Now, let go of me. How easy. about that? You think I'm yellow? Now, look, you two. I don't want no trouble here. Lay off, will you? I didn't mean you. I just meant anybody who won't stand up and fight for his country. Yeah. I'll fight for my country, same as the next guy. Don't think nothing different, eh? Is that the 
babysitter? I imagine. Good. What's your hurry? It's not eight yet. Well, I'm hungry. Oh, thirsty, you mean. Huh. Evening, Mrs. Chandler. I'm not late, am I? No, Millie, right on time. Is the baby in bed? Mm hmm. And asleep. You remember when to feed him? Yes, ma'am. Ten o'clock. Right. The bottle's in the refrigerator. You remember how to warm it up? Yes, ma'am. Oh, I left uh, milk and sandwiches in the refrigerator, too. So help yourself. We won't be gone too long. I'll be all right, Mrs. Chandler. I brought my homework, so I've got plenty to do till you get back. Yeah, well, hold down the fort, Millie. We'll yes, be at sir. the country club. I left the phone number on the telephone pad in case you need it. We'll get along just fine. Good night, Millie. Good night, Mrs. Chandler. Columbia Broadcasting System and its affiliates present the Mercury Theater on the air in War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. gentlemen, the host of the Mercury Theater. We know now that in the early years of the 20th century, this world was being watched closely by intelligences greater than man's and yet as mortal as his own. We know now that as human beings busied themselves about their various concerns, they were scrutinized and studied perhaps almost as narrowly as a man with a microscope might scrutinize the transient creatures that swarm and multiply in a drop of water. Any action, Mike? Not a thing. Get the coffee? Yeah. You said black, didn't you? Yeah, that's right. It's yours, then. Thanks. One five four, calling PD one. One five four, calling PD one. One five four. This is PD one. Come in. Mac, give me a rundown on a New Jersey license three F ninety two. Repeat, New Jersey license three F nine two. Rundown on New Jersey license three F nine two. Will do. Hold on. Wainwright again. Who else? Does he think they're all stolen cars? He calls in about 20 a night. That's what you call an obsession. He reads too much Dick Tracy. That could be. PD-1, calling 154. Go ahead, PD-1. Description, New Jersey license 3F92. 1936 blue two-door old sedan. Registration A, 387564. Motor, G, 148690. Owner, Horace Adams, 1407 West Boulevard, Camden. You got it? Got it. Thanks, Mac. Right. A real eager beaver. Well, you gotta have somebody like him to keep you awake a night like this. Yeah, I suppose Sunday nights are usually pretty dull after Labor Day. Pretty dull. You know, I took this job because I thought it was gonna be exciting. <laughs> On this particular evening, October 30th, the Crosley Rating Service estimated that 32 million people were listening in on radios. For the next 24 hours, not much change in temperature. A slight atmospheric disturbance of undetermined origin is reported over Nova Scotia, 
causing a low-pressure area to move down rather rapidly over the northeastern states, bringing a forecast of rain accompanied by winds of light gale force. Maximum temperature 66, minimum 48. This weather report comes to you from the Government Weather Bureau. We now take you to the Meridian Room in the Hotel Park Plaza in downtown New York, where you will be entertained by the music of Ramon Raquello and his orchestra. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. From the Meridian Room in the Park Plaza in New York City, we bring you the music of Ramon Raquello and his orchestra. And, with a touch of the Spanish, Ramon Raquello leads off with La Comparsita. <laughs> Thanks, Tommy. Where'd he go? You're writing that uh, Rocky Mount crash? Yep. Almost finished. How much copy you got on it? Column. Column and a half, maybe. Uh, build it to two columns. I got a good picture here and a double column spot on the front page. Okay. There's not really much to it. No serious injuries. Yeah. Could use a good lead story. All I've got is a community fund report. That's the trouble on Sunday nights. Nothing ever happens. That's right. That's the trouble with Sunday nights in the news business. Nothing ever happens. These people are comfortable, relaxed. You might say even bovine in their smug complacency. It's a Sunday night like other Sunday nights. Quiet, uneventful. America is at peace. There's no threat of war. They have no way of dreaming that within a few short minutes, their complacency is to be rudely shattered by an actor's voice speaking lines from a play. Ladies and gentlemen, we interrupt our program of dance music to bring you a special bulletin from the Intercontinental Radio News. The opening words, the words that shook a nation. At 20 minutes before 8 central time, Professor Farrell of the Mount Jennings Observatory, Chicago, Illinois, reports observing several explosions of incandescent gas occurring at regular intervals on the planet Mars. The spectroscope indicates the gas to be hydrogen and moving toward the Earth with enormous velocity. Professor Pearson of the observatory at Princeton confirms Farrell's observation and described the phenomenon as, quote, like a jet of blue flame shot from a gun, unquote. We now return you to the music of Ramon Raquello, playing for you in the Meridian Room of the Park Plaza Hotel, situated in downtown New York. <laughs> One troubled face out of ten. But this is the face of dawning panic on the night America trembled. And now, a word from John Cameron Swayze. Ladies and gentlemen, a good evening to you. When scientists learned to split the atom, they found that it released something. It was energy in the form of heat. But it wasn't much from just one atom, so they set up a chain reaction like this. They found that it made the greatest physical force mankind has ever developed. And they called it atomic fission. Now, less than 10 years ago, the Atomic Energy Commission turned to the nation's industry to harness the power of the atom 
and make it work for people in peacetime. Engineers, scientists, and technicians got together at Westinghouse to tackle the toughest job in technical history. And they succeeded. They produced usable atomic energy, the kind that drove the submarine Nautilus over 60,000 miles without refueling. And that's only the beginning of a bright new world. Later this year, many of the lights of Pittsburgh will be lit with still another Westinghouse-built reactor, the Shipping Port Power Plant, a joint venture with Duquesne Light Company and the Atomic Energy Commission. And if you wonder what putting atomic energy to work means to you, here's the man who can answer your question. He's the man who set up the Atomic Power Division of Westinghouse, Mr. Charles Weaver, Vice President for Atomic Power. Thank you, John. Today, atomic power isn't just a hope. It's as much a fact as coal and oil. Just as coal and oil started new industrial progress, atomic energy marks the beginning of a new era with new comforts, new power to get where you want to go and do what you want to do. Putting this new atomic force to useful work is a source of great satisfaction to us at Westinghouse. Yes. In atomic power, too, Westinghouse is first with the future. The night America trembled. We are bringing you the true story of the most memorable dramatic broadcast in the history of radio. The Mercury Theater's unforgettable dramatization of War of the Worlds. The broadcast has just begun. Its effect is not yet beginning to make itself felt in the cities and hamlets of a nation soon to be caught in the grip of ungovernable terror. Now a tune that never loses favor. The ever popular stardust, Ramon Raquello and his orchestra. the country to keep an astronomical watch okay. on any further disturbances occurring on the planet Mars. Planet Mars. Due to the unusual nature no of this occurrence, we have arranged an interview with the noted astronomer, Professor Pearson, who will give us his views on the subject. In a few moments, we will take you to the Princeton Observatory at Princeton, New Jersey. We return you until then to the music of Ramon Raquello and his orchestra. You turn that off. Turn it off. I'm studying. If you want to study? Go up to your own room. I'm the gregarious type, okay? You happy? Mm. This is good as a movie? <laughs> Better. <laughs> Look, the shooting star. Hey, that was a bright one. Sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So close. You feel you can just reach right up and touch them. Sure, you can. Do you want a handful? <laughs> You're crazy. Crazy about you. Nice. Mm -hmm. I got something for you today. What? This. How about it? 
What will my parents say? Oh, you know what they'll say. They'll say we're too young, too immature, but they've been saying that for a year. What do you say? Shall we? Tonight, right now. We... I, I'd like to, Bob, but... What's the matter? Aren't you sure? Yes, I'm sure. Well, then... I, I know a justice of the peace, and we could be there in an hour. Ladies and gentlemen, a special announcement from Trenton, New Jersey. It is reported that at 8.50 p.m., a huge flaming object, believed to be a meteorite, fell on a farm in the neighborhood of Grover's Mill, New Jersey, 22 miles from Trenton. The flash in the sky was visible within a radius of several hundred miles, and the noise of the impact was heard as far north as Elizabeth. We have dispatched a special mobile unit to the scene, and we'll have our commentator, Mr. Phillips, give you a word description as soon as he can reach there from Princeton. In the meantime, we take you to the Hotel Martinet in Brooklyn, where Bobby Millett and his orchestra are offering a program of dance music. Let me see what you think. Yeah, couldn't be. New Jersey's 500 miles north. We take you now to Grover's Mill. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Carl Phillips again at the Woolman Farm, Grover's Mill, New Jersey. Professor Pearson and myself made the 11 miles from Princeton in just 10 minutes. Well, I... I hardly know where to begin to paint for you a word picture of the strange scene before my eyes. I guess that's the... the thing directly in front of me, half buried in a vast pit. It must have struck with terrific force. The, the ground is covered with splinters of a tree it must have struck on the way down. Now, what I can see of the object itself doesn't look very much like a meteor, at least not like the meteors I've seen. It looks... Well, it looks more like a huge cylinder. The color is sort of yellowish-white. Curious spectators now are pressing close to the object in spite of the efforts of the police to keep them back. One man wants to touch the thing. He's having an argument with a policeman. And the policeman wins. Now, now ladies and gentlemen, there's something I haven't mentioned in all this excitement, but it's becoming more distinct. Perhaps you've caught it already on your radio. Listen. You hear it? It's a, it's a curious humming sound that seems to come from inside the object. Now, I'll move the microphone closer. Now, here we are. Now, we're not more than, oh, 25 feet away. Can you hear it now? Hello? Oh, hello, Molly. No, no, I'm just uh, waiting here for Mr. Paul and his wife. We're going to church. The radio? No, I haven't. Why? What? Well, just for a minute, perhaps. Thanks, Molly. The thing is smooth and, as you can see, of cylindrical shape. Just a minute. Just a minute, something's happening. Ladies and gentlemen, this is terrific. This end of the thing is beginning to flake off. The top is beginning to rotate like, like a screw. The thing must be hollow. Hey, she, she's a-moving. The darn thing's unscrewing. Keep back there. Keep back, I tell you. Hey, hey, maybe there's men in it trying to escape. It's red hot. They'll burn to a cinder. Keep back there. Keep those idiots back. She's off! The top's loose! Look out there! Stand back! Ladies and gentlemen, this is the most terrifying thing I have ever witnessed. W wait a minute. Someone's crawling out of the hollow top. Someone or... or something. I can see peering out of that black hole two luminous disks. Are they eyes? I it might be a face. It might be... Good heavens, something's wriggling out of the shadow like a gray snake. Now it's another. And another. They look like tentacles to me. There, I can see the thing's body. It's, it's, it's as large as a bear, and it glistens like wet leather. 
The face, it's indescribable. I can hardly force myself to keep looking at it. The eyes are black and clean like a circle. Oh, no, please. No, Bob. Let's be shaped with saliva dripping from its ribbon. Okay. lips that seem to quiver and pulsate. The monster, or whatever it is, can hardly move. It seems weighted down by worldwide possible. Oh, horrible. Oh, I'm Royal City Desk. A what? Wait a minute. Hey, Johnny, you got anything on the wire about a meteor falling in New Jersey? No, ma'am, we haven't got anything on it. Nothing at all. No, ma'am. Don't mention it. What do you suppose is ailing her? Why, what's up? She said she heard something on the radio about a meteor landing in New Jersey carrying Martian monsters. Oh boy, people. <laughs> so, the Mercury Theater on the air blithely proceeds with its dramatization of H.G. Wells' War of the World. The actors, of course, have no way of knowing their performance is sowing the seeds of panic amongst hundreds of thousands who believe they're actually hearing a factual report. But others are beginning to feel its impact. For instance, the officers on duty at the state police and fire dispatcher's office in Trenton, New Jersey. State police. No, sir, we don't know anything about that. Sir, there is no Grover's Mill in New Jersey. There's a Grovesville, but there's no Grover's Mill. I can't help it, sir, what the radio says. There's no such place. State police. No, ma'am, we don't know anything about that. Well, I can't help that, ma'am. We just don't know anything about it. Brother, did I say something about a quiet Sunday evening? Well, what's going on, anyway? I don't know. They say it's been announced on the radio. You better check. State police. No, sir, we have no information on that. Sorry. We are bringing you an eyewitness account of what's happening on the Wilmoth Farm, Roversville, New Jersey. That must be it. What the hell's he talking about Grover's Mill? There's no such place. Maybe it's just a play or something. We now return you to Carl Phillips at Grover's Mill. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, am I on? Ladies and gentlemen, here I am back of a stone wall that adjoins Mr. Woolman's garden. From here, I get a sweep of the whole scene. I'll give you every detail as long as I can talk, as long as I can see. More state police have arrived. More state police? They're drawing up a hey, court just in front play. of the pit. State police. No, sir, we have no information on that yet. We're checking it now. All right. Just wait till next year, you'll see. Oh, next year, next year. Always next year. The Dodgers ain't won a penny since 1920. Uh, that <laughs> means they're never going to win another, huh? Probably. Boy, I wish I knew all the answers like you do. You oh, know, come just, on, you guys. Why are you two always arguing? Mike, have you heard? Heard what? About the Martians. A spaceship full of Martians landed near Trenton, 50 miles from here. It's on the radio now. Martians? Well, that's what the guy said. What guy? It's some guy on the radio, some professor from Princeton. The state cops are out there now. The captain and two policemen advance with something in their hands. Yes, I can see it now. It's a white handkerchief tied to a pole, a flag of truce. If those creatures know what that means, what, what anything means... Wait, wait, something's happening. A hump shape is rising out of the pit. I can make out a small beam of light against the mirror. What's that? There's a jet of flame springing from that mirror and it leaps right at the advancing men. It strikes them head on. Good Lord, they're turning into flame. Now the whole field's caught fire. The woods, the barns, the gas tanks of automobiles, it's spreading everywhere. It's coming this way, about 20 yards to my right. Ladies and gentlemen, due to circumstances beyond our control, we are unable to continue the broadcast from Grover's Mill. Evidently, there is some difficulty with our field transmission. However, we will return you to that spot at the earliest opportunity. Well, come on. In the meantime... Uh, come on, we've we got to get down there fast. I've got a car. California. Down where? Down to Grover's Mill. Well, where's Grover's Mill? Somewhere near Trenton, I think. Oh, now, wait a minute, fellas. We don't know what this is all about. Oh, don't know. It's like I told you. It's the Nazis. The guy on the radio said it was monsters for mine. It's Nazi air raids. Come on. Come on. We've got to get down. Hey, you guys, wait for me. Ladies and gentlemen, 
I have just been handed a message that came from Grover's Mill by telephone. Uh, just a moment. Who's deal? Well, speak up. What's the matter? Is anybody interested in poker anymore? Todd, this is important. Listen. At least 40 people, including six state troopers, lie dead in a field east of Grover's Mill. Their bodies burned and distorted beyond all possible recognition. Ladies and gentlemen, the next voice you hear will be that of Brigadier General Montgomery Smith, commander of the state militia at Trenton, New Jersey. Trenton, that's where my family lives. Listen, listen. I have been requested by the governor of New Jersey to place the counties of Mercer and Middlesex as far west as Princeton and east to Jamesburg under martial law. Four companies of state militia are proceeding from Trenton to Grover's Mill and will aid in the evacuation of homes within the range of military operations. Thank you. You have just been listening Charlie, to you General Montgomery. Charlie, you hear that? They're calling out the Army. Hey, my folks, I, I think I better call. Now, meantime, take it easy, bud. They're all right. What do you know? What's wrong? Charlie, how far is that from here? Couple hundred miles. Come on, let's play cards. Huh? Well, I'll tell me out. I don't want to play. Fire. Combined fire departments oh, in Mercer County are fighting the flames which menace the entire countryside. We have been unable to establish any contact with our mobile unit at Grover's Mill but we hope to be able to return you there at the earliest possible moment. Something moving, solid metal, kind of a shield-like affair rising up out of the cylinder. It's standing on legs, actually rearing up on a sort of metal framework. Now it's reaching above the trees and the searchlights are on it. Hold on! Ladies and gentlemen, I have a grave announcement to make. Incredible as it may seem, both the observations of science and the evidence of our own eyes lead to the inescapable assumption that those strange beings who landed in the Jersey farmlands tonight are the vanguard of an invading army from the planet Mars. Mars? Bob, Bob, turn around. Go back. Go back. Bob, Bob, I want to go home. I want to go home. <laughs> And now, back from vacation, here's Betty Furness. Welcome back, Betty. Thank you. It's very nice to be back. And now, I want to show you an exciting new symbol. And here it is. The symbol that represents the very newest ideas in home appliances. New design, new performance. It's the shape of tomorrow from Westinghouse. And now, here's the exciting shape of tomorrow in brand new 1958 Westinghouse laundry equipment, the 1958 Spacemate. Here, you'll find the shape of tomorrow in this modern new design. The shape of tomorrow a new convenience, too. Imagine a clothes dryer that operates right on top of the laundromat and takes up only 25 inches of space. And look, now push button controls for the most accurate washing and drying yet. And here is the exciting new custom imperial laundromat and dryer. You'll see the shape of tomorrow in this style light control panel that lights up like this. Push button controls that give five wash and two rinse temperatures. And that same stunning control panel lights up this twin electric clothes dryer. Push button controls here too give you just the right drying for every kind of fabric. And here, the shape of tomorrow means the very last word in convenience in this beautiful Westinghouse wash and dry combination. It takes just two minutes of your time to load clothes and set the dials. And your clothes are beautifully washed and properly dried all automatically. In every laundromat, there's the famous revolving agitator that washes cleaner, rinses better, and even cleans itself. And every dryer has new, improved, direct airflow drying. See the 1958 Westinghouse Shape of Tomorrow laundromats and dryers now. The most advanced and the most complete line of home laundry equipment made today. And remember, too, you can be sure if it's Westinghouse. October 30th, 1938. The night America trembled. The impact of the Mercury Theater's broadcast of H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds is as devastating as it is unexpected. The Columbia Broadcasting System and its affiliated stations, the newspapers, the police and fire departments of the whole nation 
All are being deluged by a Niagara of calls from frenzied listeners who believe the radio drama to be the real thing. More than a million listeners from coast to coast are caught in the grip of a contagious mass hysteria, and they flee in terror from an incredible bogeyman, mythical invaders from the planet Mars. Strewn over the battle area from Grover's Mill to Plainsboro, crushed and trampled to death under the metal feet of the monster, or burned to cinders by its heat ray. Langham Field, Virginia. Scouting planes report three Martian machines visible above treetops, moving north towards Somerville with population fleeing ahead of them. Heat ray not in use. Although advancing at express train speed, invaders pick their way carefully. One moment, please. Here is a bullet from Basking Ridge, New Jersey. Coon hunters have stumbled on a second cylinder similar to the first, embedded in the great swamp 20 miles Hello? south of Morris. Hello? Is this the country club? I want to speak to Mr. or Mrs. Chandler. And hurry. Please hurry. The can be open and the fighting machine ring. They are taking a position to the foothills. Hello? Mr. Chandler, this is Millie. Can you come home, please, right away? No, the baby's all right. It's the Martians. Yes, Martians. Do you mean you haven't heard? Oh, Mr. Chandler, it's all over the radio. Awful things are happening. The Martians have landed in New Jersey with flamethrowers and poison gas. bombing plane B-843 off Bayonne, New Jersey. Lieutenant Boat commanding eight bombers reporting to Commander Fairfax Langham Field. This is Boat reporting to Commander Fairfax Langham Field. Enemy tripod machines now in sight, reinforced by three machines from the Morristown Cylinder, six altogether. One machine partially crippled, believed hit by shell from Army gun and watch on mountains. Guns now appear silent. A heavy black fog hanging close to the earth of extreme You want me to do? Yes, listen, this thing's gotten out of no hand. Sign of the switchboard downstairs is flooded with calls. Enemy People who think it's the Royal McCoy. You're no, kidding. I wish I were. It's, it's an awful the mess. The but they can. It was clearly announced as a play. Well, I know that, city. but they don't. Well, what do you want me to do? Why can't you make some sort of an announcement? Tell them it's just a dramatization. Well, it's three minutes to the break. We'll tell them that. do that, please. The switchboard out there is about ready to go to their minds. Plane circling. Ready to strike. A thousand yards and we'll be over the first. Eight hundred yards. Six hundred. Four hundred. Two hundred. There they go. The giant arm raised. Green flash. They're spraying us with flame. Two thousand feet. Engines are giving out. No chance to release bombs. Only one thing left. Drop on them, plane and all. We're diving on the first one. The engine's gone. Eight. This is Bayonne, New Jersey, calling Langham Field. This is Bayonne, New Jersey, calling Langham Field. Come in, please. Come in, please. This is Langham Field. Go ahead. Eight Army bombers in engagement with enemy tripod machines over Jersey Flats. Threatened in New Jersey, operator. How many times do I have to tell you? Will you please hurry? What do you mean you can't do it? You've got to get through. Heavy black smoke in the direction. The circuits are busy. Come on, I got to call home too. Hey, where's Charlie going? Charlie's driving home with Dave. Hurry up the phone, will you please? Black smoke pouring in from Jersey marshes. Reaches South Street. Gas masks useless. Urge population to move into open spaces. Automobiles use Route 7, 23, 24. Avoid congested areas. Smoke now spreading over Raymond Boulevard. It's just a radio play, sir. State police. No, no, ma'am, ma'am, it's just a radio play. State police. No, sir, it's just a radio... No, sir, we have no official confirmation, but we believe it's just a radio play. 
You got anything yet, Brownie? No. Wait a minute. Something's coming in now. <clears throat> hey, this is it. State police. It's just a radio thought. play, ma'am. Attention, yes. all units. Attention, We're not all sure units. We think so. There is yes. no invasion from You're Mars. Welcome. The invasion panic is the result of a radio broadcast. Repeat, there is no invasion from Mars. Proceed to distribute this information place, as quickly as possible. Yes, sir, where possible. Attention all units. Attention all units. I'm speaking from the roof of the broadcasting building, New York City. The bells you hear are ringing to warn people to evacuate the city as the Martians approach. Estimate that in the last two hours, three million people have moved out along the roads to the north. Hutchison River Parkway still kept open for motor traffic. Avoid bridges to Long Island, hopelessly jammed. All communication with Jersey Shore closed 10 minutes ago. No more defenses. Our army wiped out. Artillery, Air Force, everything wiped out. This may be the last broadcast. We'll stay here to the end. Oh! 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 Oh, Jane! It's the end of the world! We're all going to die! I just heard it on the radio! Give me a ticket. Anywhere. As far as this will take me. And hurry! The Martians are coming! Black smoke drifting over the city. People in the streets see it now. They're running towards the East River. Thousands of them dropping in like rats. Now the smoke's spreading faster. It's reached Times Square. They're falling like flies. Now the smoke is crossing 6th Avenue. 5th Avenue. It's 100 yards away. 50 feet. What on earth is the matter with you? The baby! The monsters! The monsters are going to kill us! Now, monsters, what monsters? What are you talking about? Radio? Dad, the announcer must be dead. 2X2L calling CQ. 2X2L calling CQ. 2X2L calling CQ, New York. Isn't there anyone on the air? Isn't there anyone? 2X2L. It's just a radio play, sir. The whole city must have gone nuts. You mean the whole nation? The AP says the same thing's happening everywhere. Well, this is the lead story I wanted, and I can't even find time to remake the front page. When is this ever going to end? It's just a radio play, man. No, man. There is no invasion. It's just a radio play. Engine Company 5 and Chemical 3 to Somerset and hey, War. Hey, well, well, where's Grover's Mills? We come to volunteer. Volunteer? Yeah, yeah the Nazi war place where they land. Where's the Martians? He's all lost. There are no Martians. There are no Nazis. It's just a radio play. Now go home. A radio play? That's all. Now beat it. Get out of here. But, Chief, it was clearly announced as a play. Here's a publicity release in tonight's paper. Now listen. When the Mercury Theater on the air broadcasts over the Columbia Network at 8 p.m., they will do H.G. Wells' War of the World. This is one of the first shows about Martians. It tells how the octopus-like creatures from Mars lay waste the Earth until there are only a few humans left. Yes, that's absolutely right. Every paper. Well, how clear can you make a thing? All they had to do was check. Nobody in his right mind would believe it. Here for Rudy Valley for three days. I'm getting hungry. Hungry? Yeah. Well, I'm the one that's hungry. I tell you, Charlie, I, I'm so starved, I could almost... Uh... Don't look at me that way. <laughs> no, I'm just going to go over I don't What's the matter? What's going on here? <laughs> it's a meteor, sir. No, it's the Martians. They're coming after us. They're destroying the world. Martians, what are you talking about? It's on the radio. We've been listening to the radio ever since you left. We haven't heard anything about it. I don't get it. It ought to be on every station. I'm Turn sure. Turn the CBS. This is your host, ladies and gentlemen. Out of character to assure you, that the War of the Worlds has no further significance than as the holiday offering it was intended to be. The Mercury Theater's own radio version of dressing up in a sheet and jumping out of a bush and saying boo. Starting now, we couldn't soap all your windows and steal all your garden gates by tomorrow night, so we did the next best thing. We annihilated the world before your very ears and utterly destroyed the Columbia Broadcasting System. Now, you will be relieved, I hope, to learn that we didn't mean it, and that both institutions are still open for business. So, goodbye, everybody, and remember, please, for the next uh, day or so, the terrible lesson you learned tonight. That grinning, glowing, globular invader of your living room 
is an inhabitant of the pumpkin patch. And uh, if your doorbell rings and nobody's there, that was no Martian. It's Halloween. <laughs> Why didn't you check the other stations? Well, we didn't have time, sir. We were too busy listening. You mean you really believed it? <laughs> oh, you kids have got a lot to learn. Yeah, I guess you're right. It's all right, Millie. It's all over now. Are you sure, Mrs. Chang? <laughs> yes, Millie. Just a radio play, Millie. I, I can't believe it. It was so real. Ah, yes. It was so real. So real that it completely fooled poor Millie and more than a million others who slowly came to their senses and realized they'd been panicked by a colossal Halloween joke. And what were their reactions? Well, many laughed, with perhaps just a touch of hysterical relief in their laughter. Me scared? Of course not. I knew it was a play all the time. Sure, me and the old woman, we run down the streets, mingle with the crowds, but we wasn't scared ourselves, just for the kicks. See how the others was taking it. <laughs> you know what I mean. Others were somewhat indignant. A fine trick to play on people. My, my sister passed out. The, all the kids were screaming their heads off. The whole house was in an uproar. Is that what you call entertainment? And still others were furiously angry. Hello, CBS. Say, what are you going to do about me? I'm 300 miles from home without a penny in my pocket. Where am I calling from? Buffalo, New York. That's where I'm calling from, and it's all your fault. So the reactions of the period. But there is one thing we must not overlook. All this took place in 1938, in a less sophisticated yesteryear, that did not know the atom bomb guided missiles and rockets that may shortly fly to the moon. Twenty years ago, the concept of an alien race was novel to us, hence alarming. Today, we realize that Mars is very near, closer perhaps in time than we imagine. There is every reason to believe that long before the Martians come to us, we will go to them. I wonder if we'll panic them as they did us on the night America trembled. Tonight, John Cameron Swayze is playing with fire. Ladies and gentlemen, a good evening to you. I'm using this torch as a high concentration of heat. Now, I ask you to tell me whether heat is a friend or an enemy. Heat will light a friendly cigarette. But it can also burn up hard-earned money, uh, if I let it. Heat runs power stations that make electricity. Here's one of the most efficient producers of electricity in the world the Kiger Creek Station of the Ohio Valley Electric Corporation. It's more efficient because Westinghouse engineers have found new ways to harness extra heat to run these turbines. Big turbine blades, for example, look like this. Until recently, they could only stand so much heat and pressure. The limit had been reached. No available metal could lick the problem. So Westinghouse metallurgists came up with a brand new kind of steel that raised the limits of heat and cut the cost of making electricity. One of these pieces of steel wire is made of Westinghouse metal. It will stand the kind of heat we're talking about. The other won't. Metal developed in Westinghouse laboratories will help this power station to produce more electricity for less money. Over the years, Westinghouse engineering has helped to make electricity your best servant, the biggest bargain in your family budget. Improvement on top of improvement has made Westinghouse first with the future in research, in engineering, in new ideas, you can be sure if it's Westinghouse. 
Westinghouse products seen on tonight's program are made in Mansfield, Ohio, and in Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Your friends and neighbors at the more than 60 Westinghouse plants throughout America hope you enjoyed tonight's play. Next week, Westinghouse Studio One presents First Prize for Murder, written especially for Studio One by Phil Reisman, Jr., based on a story by John D. McDonald, starring Darren McGavin. Who is Nathaniel Arch? No one has ever seen him. Here is the best available picture of the mysterious Mr. Arch. All that is known is that he wrote the mystery novel Double Dead, which has won Mystery Writers of America's prize for the best novel by a new writer. It is not widely known, however, that Double Dead reveals the details of an actual double murder that the authorities have never been able to solve. Be sure to join us next week to find the answer to Who is Nathaniel Arch? in First Prize for Murder, starring Darren McGavin. Two weeks from tonight, Westinghouse Studio One brings you the first part of the exciting drama, Mutiny on the Shark, written especially for Studio One by Max Ehrlich, starring Richard Basehart. A story of the new kind of living that the atomic age has brought with it the drama of life aboard an atomic submarine. Be with us again two weeks from tonight for part one of Mutiny on the Shark, starring Richard Basehart. Or burning your fingers reaching for toast. This beautiful new Westinghouse toaster with this exclusive lift-up lever lifts small pieces an extra inch. Buy now. Save six dollars on confection colors model, four dollars on chrome model. Your choice only $15.95. Studio One gratefully acknowledges the cooperation of Paramount Pictures, whose current release is Cecil B. DeMille's Ten Commandments. Westinghouse Studio One has come to you from New York and has been selected for viewing by America's armed forces at home and overseas. This is Art Hanna saying good night for Westinghouse.